While his senior brothers were privileged to pursue their careers, David had no choice as he was condemned to the wilderness. While in the wilderness, he did not grumble. He did not abandon his meaner responsibilities of tending his father's sheep to the extent that he often risked his life on many occasions to wrestle with lions and bears to rescue his father's sheep from the mouth of predators. He was living in absolute obscurity when God sent prophet Samuel to bring him out so that he could step into his destiny. He waited patiently for God's time and never deviated from the path of righteousness but went through the training in isolation. In the wilderness, courageously, without him knowing why he was so deprived. Prophet Moses enjoyed the princely life of royalty for 40 years. He enjoyed affluence, authority, wealth, all the earthly pleasures you can think of before God took him away without notice and relocated him to the wilderness. Can you just for a moment try and picture this sudden change in his lifestyle? It is like a head of a state or a head of a nation deposed and had to escape into exile for his life with no money, no family, no usual entourage or chase of friends and escorts. But Moses found himself at the mercy of a wealthy man called Jethro, who employed him to be tendering his flock of sheep in the wilderness. I am sure many of us we spend most of our years crying over our lost glories instead of adjusting ourselves to the present situation or position and try to find out why God has put us in this situation and what does God want us to learn. It took Moses another 40 years of harsh training and bitter experiences of survivorship in the wilderness before God eventually revealed to him his assignment as a liberator and leader of a great nation who will lead the nation of Israel and people over 2 million people from Egypt across the wilderness to the promised land of Canaan. This is obviously humanly impossible and it could only be accomplished through the mighty hand of God of Israel. Since once in the wilderness, you cannot get food, you cannot get water, clothing or supermarkets to buy your biggest needs. But with God, everything is possible. Amen. 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 Despite the humanly impossible task given to Moses, like David, he remained steadfast, putting all his trust in God, Jehovah, living a holy life in righteousness before and hence they were all successful in their assignments. Today, in our modern age, when we are entrusted with lesser responsibilities or assignments, we forget that it is not because we are better than others. And that is why we are there or we consider ourselves more superior to the positions that we are asked to manage. And hence we lose focus or reason why we are acting in that capacity. If David had known he would be king of Israel one day before his anointing, do you think he would have risked his life challenging lions and bears? To rescue a sheep when there were a few hundreds left, I am sure he would have let go. But God saw this faithfulness and devotion to servicing him, which made God to consider him a man after his own heart that could be entrusted to shepherd his people Israel. To serve God, my brothers and sisters. It is mandatory that we must strive to be holy. God's holy character is the standard of absolute moral perfection. Amen. 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 As revealed in Isaiah 5.16, but the Lord of hosts will be exhausted in judgment, and the holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. God's holiness. His transcendent majesty and the purity of his character are skillfully pre presented in Psalm 99, 1-3. It portrays God's distance from earthly things. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. And he is exhausted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. 
verses 4 and 5, emphasize God's separation from sin and evil. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established security. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his full stool. Holy is his name. We learn that in the Old Testament, God demanded holiness in the lives of his people. Through Moses, God said to Israel, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2 If God is omnipotent, he is Alpha and Omega. He will hence be the same God in the Old Testament as our God today, who is now demanding of us holiness in our lives. How can we then be holy? In the Old Testament, there were two types of holiness as practiced by the children of Israel, external or ceremonial holiness, and second one, internal or moral or spiritual holiness. Ceremonial holiness, as we read in the Pentecost, which are the five books of Moses known as the Torah in the Old Testament, explained the procedure to be undertaken before anybody could be considered into the service of God of Israel. It involves rituals of dedication. We read that God commanded Moses to sanctify Aaron and his sons, as well as priests and Levites, as in Exodus 29. This is what you ask to do to consecrate them, so that they may serve me as priests. Take a young bull and two rams without defect. The process of consecration was very complex and cumbersome rituals. Also, the Hebrew Nazarite, as we read in Numbers 6, 1 to 21, how to consecrate in order to serve God. You could see it was not an assignment or a profession or a career that anybody can just wake up in the middle of the night and decide he wants to become or he wants to be a priest. Or you have to be called and be given the grace to serve God. Amen. All the prophets in the Old Testament were called by God such as prophet Elisha, as we read in 1 Kings 19, 15 to 16. The Lord said to Elijah, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, son of Shephat, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shephat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. The choice of succession and assignment is the Lord's prerogative and not in the hand of man. It is in the churches of modern days that servants of God scout around searching for assistants who will succeed or work with them in the administration of Christ's ministry. Since most churches today have been reduced to commercial entities and no more entrusted to Christ to lead his church but administration left to human judgment. And this is why God told Prophet Samuel, when the first son of Jesse stood before him, and he thinking, this is God's anointed. But God said in 1 Samuel 16, 6-7, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. Amen. Is that not what is happening in all our lives today? Do we, or can we ever look at others with the same eyes that God looks at the same man? How many men have married their spouses because of their beauty or physical appearance? Or how many women have accepted to marry their spouses because of physical appearance, but later end up with many regrets because you get married to only the good qualities in him or her and never bother to realize that we all have our good sides as well as our bad virtues in us, which we have to work out in life. And it takes each partner the responsibility to give that helping hand. Unfortunately, 
Most so-called Christians are so selfish and unrighteous today to see the loss in their own eyes, but quick to judge and condemn and hence fail to know that for every success in a man's life, there is a woman and not necessarily your mother and same thing goes for the woman. There is always a man in your life to lift you up and bring you to where you are functioning today. We all need each other. No one can ever be an island. Yes. Many nations have been crippled today because of bad leadership. Yes. Because the people who are busy looking for successful assistants that possess the types of qualities that suit their own wealth and comprises. Who will only see things the same direction, right or wrong, and the result is peaceful stagnation and fear of stepping out of safe zone. In as long as society prefers ceremonial holiness or external holiness to moral and spiritual holiness, we shall never be free from the slavery of sin. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he saw the style of lives of the Pharisees and scribes, he referred to them as white sepulchre. As we read in Luke 11, 39 and 44, then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, Clean the outside of the cups and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Despite all the messages that have been sent to us by God through his servants, in respect of our stewardship to God, where we compile the list of our members who paid tithes in 2012. The result was very disappointing and demoralizing. And nothing to boast about in the council of clergy, where every clergy come to sing the praises of their devoted worshippers with which God has blessed their churches. It is very incredible that 80% of all office holders who are holding leadership positions in the church Perform very woefully. Unfortunately, our present leaders do not consider it immoral to be serving God as leaders in the church and yet refusing to support that church morally and financially. And yet you derive our spiritual benefits from that church. Amen. Among the church activities which require the active participation of all leaders are the Bible study on Wednesdays and the prayer service on Fridays. It is dishonorable to God for you leaders to sit at home and just refuse to attend the Bible study where you will be able to develop your spiritual capacity of faith since faith comes from hearing the word of God which will fashion your life as a shining example to those you are leading irrespective of your age whether you are youth ministry or adult ministry if you are morally bankrupt, it will be difficult and impossible for you to influence anybody under you positively, Amen. since you cannot give what you yourself don't have. Amen. 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 In most big churches, leadership positions are held in high esteem that you have to satisfy certain mandatory conditions before your name can be forwarded to leaders' committee meeting for consideration. By the grace of God, the laxity we still exercise in our church will very soon be addressed. As God has promised, we shall grow in 2013 and be blessed with more dedicated men and women who are willing and ready to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. If it had been possible for us to publish the list of our performances for 2012 for everyone to see how they support God in return for all the blessings they receive from Him, maybe this gesture would touch our conscience and spur us to improve our performance for 2013. Amen. But since we cannot do it, I leave you to your conscience. Amen. Glory. If our God is holy, we do have to be holy in doing all the things commanded by God. Amen. The Bible said in Proverbs 11, 18, The wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. 
And in chapter 22, eight to 9, we are told, He who sows wickedness reaps troubles, Amen. and the rod of his fury or fury will be destroyed. Yes. A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. And finally, let us see what 2 Corinthians 9, 6 teaches us. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, we also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously, we also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. But God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Amen. So that in all things and on all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, yes. he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Amen. Amen. In the New Testament, the ceremonial holiness prominent in the Old Testament books of Torah was all moved to the background. Much of Judaism in Jesus' time believed so much in ceremonial holiness, believing salvation was by works alone. As mentioned in Mark 7, 1 to 5, then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defy, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of the cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered them, and said unto them, Where hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How bit in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like you do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The early church perceived that holiness of life was a profound internal reality that should govern an individual's thought and attitude in relation to persons and objects in the external world. In the New Testament, Holiness took a more meaningful dimension. Jesus confirmed the ethical nature of God when he taught his disciples to pray that the Father's name must be esteemed for what it is. Hallowed be thy name. Must be esteemed as we read in Matthew 6, 9. In the book of Revelation, the Father's moral perfection is described with the threefold assumption of holiness borrowed from Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy Amen. is the Lord God Almighty, Amen. who was and is and is to come. The transcendence and majesty of God was also echoed by Mary, mother of our Lord Jesus, in Luke one forty nine. For the mighty one had done great things for me. Holy is his name. In the same way, the holiness of Jesus Christ is also emphasized in the New Testament as the Bible tells us in Luke 1.35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Amen. 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 We also learned how even the demons were scared of Jesus Amen. since they to recognize his holiness yes. as in Luke 4, 34, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who art the Holy One of God. Amen. 
but he rebuked them. In Acts of Apostles 3, 13 to 15, Apostle Peter, where he was witnessing before the Jews, had this to say, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son, Jesus, whom he delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, where he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a wanderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead. We are of, we are witnesses. Amen. Peter also referred to Jesus as the Holy One and just. John, as holiness to the Father and the Son, as we understand in Hebrew 7.26, for such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And also in Revelation 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, this thing said, he that is holy, he that is true, he that had the key of David, he that opened and no man shut it, and shut it and no man opened it. Glory be to holy name. Amen. Since the Spirit comes from God and is the instrument of God's holy purposes in the world, Hallelujah. he also is absolutely holy. Amen. As we read in Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And also in Matthew 3, 16, 17, his holiness is hereby reconfirmed. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the world. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. The common title, Holy Spirit, confirms the ethical perfection of the third person of the Godhead, as we will read in John 3, 5 to 8. Jesus answered, Verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof but cannot tell where it cometh and whither it go. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And also in the same John 14, 16 to 18, our Lord Jesus Christ made this remarkable revelation by his disciples and followers. And I will pray the Father, and he shall show you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwell with you, and shall be in you, and not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Since we know that ever since the Comforter has come into our lives, what position? Does it occupy in the church of Christ? Apostle Paul teaches that Christ loved the church and for her he died, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. As he wrote in the Ephesian church to the Ephesians 5.26, Peter also addressed the church as a holy people. In language he borrowed from the Old Testament, the church is hence a holy nation, Amen. separated from the unbelieving nations, and consecrated to the Lord, as we read in 1 Peter 2.9. 
but ye are a chosen generation, yes. a royal priesthood, yes. a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness Amen. into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. From all the confirmations that the scripture have been giving us concerning holiness, as being related to God, to our Lord Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit and to the church, I am sure there is no doubt in our minds that what is also required of us who are members of that Holy Church of Christ, where holiness is now referred to humans created in the image of God, certainly such humans must also be expected to possess or cultivate all the attributes of God. The New Testament often discusses holiness in relation to individual Christians. Believers in Christ are frequently referred to as saints. Literally means holy ones. Since through faith, God justifies sinners, pronouncing them holy in His sight. We must understand, however, that a justified sinner is by no means morally perfect. But God does declare believers to be guiltless. Apostle Paul realized this grace, hence referred to Christians at Corinth. That's why they are being plagued with numerous sins. Address his hearing friends as those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus. Amen. Called to be saints. 1 Corinthians 1 2, in other words. Despite their problems, the Corinthians believers were still referred to as holy ones in Christ. The New Testament, however, places great stress upon the reality of practical holiness in the Christian daily experience. That God, who gracefully declares a person righteous through faith in Christ, commands that the believer should also progress in holiness of life. We must endeavor to be holy in all our actions, in all our thoughts, and in all our words, so that our God's people church phrase of grace, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. May be truly acceptable to God. Amen. We repeat this phrase of blessing every Sunday. And every end of our prayers, and yet sadly enough, we seem not to understand any word of this powerful declaration as during the time we are worshipping before our God, the thoughts of most of us are not in the church. So find that time to listen to the word of God as convenient time to task texting with mobile phone. Uh -huh. Why some use this precious time to monitor their husband's or girlfriend's activities on Facebook? Amen. Why some choose the time when we are about to listen to the word of God to decide to go out and stretch their legs or rest room? We treat the house of God with such levity as if saying, what can God do for me? After all, I do not see him. Man. For how long shall we remain adamant and stiff naked like the chain of Israel in our state of hopelessness? Man. A God's plan, a growth in holiness to accompany believing. Mm -hmm. If you cannot have faith, you will continue to wander about in total darkness, yes. even with the two eyes wide open. Hallelujah. Glory. The choice is yours today. To so still remain in the wilderness or join the holy ones in their march forward to the promised land. Amen. 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 God graciously provides the spiritual resources to enable Christians to be 